Hey, this is Clayton Lawrence, the super heavyweight boxer for Team ISV, and you're listening to VIOC in action. Hi, this is Cy Thompson, laser sailor for Team ISV, and you're listening to VIOC in action. This is your high hurdle specialist, Eddie Lovett, for Team VI, and you're tuned in to VIOC in action. This is Laverne Jones for Virgin Islands four-time Olympian and sixth fastest female in the 60-meter history. Tune in to VIOC in action to learn about athletes and what motivates us. Remember, teamwork make the dream work. All right. Greetings and welcome to VIOC in action. This is Athlete Bobby Thomas here with you, giving you the information from the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee Celebrating 50 plus years of showing off some of the great talents in the Virgin Islands. Let me give you a little bit about our history again about the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee. Hey, well, it's time now for VIOC Moment in History. In 1966, several sports-minded citizens of the Virgin Islands agreed that something had to be done to provide our athletes with a better chance to compete on the international level. The first requirement was to affiliate at least five sports to their respective international federations by convincing these international federations that their sports were active in the Virgin Islands and that our athletes could compete on a regional level. Six sports affiliated track and field, yachting, weightlifting, basketball, fencing, and volleyball. As a result of a major lobbying effort to the International Olympic Committee, the Virgin Islands was granted permission to participate on a trial basis in the 1966 San Juan Central American and Caribbean Games. Despite many difficulties, Carl Plaskett, Ivan David, Listen Sproul, Rudy Thompson, and John Hamber won medals. As a result, the Virgin Islands was granted full membership status in the International Olympic Committee. The Virgin Islands Olympic Committee was built on that auspicious beginning and with the exception of the boycotted 1980 Olympics in Moscow has sent a team to every Central American and Caribbean, Pan American and Olympic competition since 1966. The Virgin Islands Olympic Committee's first Olympic medal was won in 1988 at the Seoul Olympics. The VIOC has grown from its original six federations now to 22. Virgin Islands is extremely grateful to the VIOC founders, Calvin Whitley, Julio Francis Edwards, Vern Carwood, Len Stein, Tracy Jackal for having the foresight, courage, stamina, and determination to bring the Virgin Islands into the Olympic arena. This is your VIOC Moment in History. VIOC moment in history, and it's something to think about because we here in the Virgin Islands are seen as equal to others around the globe, other national Olympic committees. And to have a national Olympic committee is, trust me, it is a big deal. It is a feather in your cap as a society to be recognized globally as peers to... Um, basically the nations around the globe all the other nations you know uh it's a it's a status symbol that is sought heavily sought after by many and you have to do big things to get involved and as you heard from our moment in history the outstanding virgin islanders that made those strides for us and a few Shows ago, I did uh, a show where I had some explanation of some of the sports that were being uh, competed in for the Winter Olympics. Naturally, because most of us who reside here in the Virgin Islands, you know, it's, it's not a natural thing to know about downhill skiing or slalom skiing or uh, luge or curling so i i leaned on the internet for <laughs> for some information as to 
you know, explain these games for us. And the explanations were, were interesting. Now, what did not, <laughs> it did not come across as strange to, to listen to the, the uh, narrator's voice who had some kind of uh, probably an English accent, uh, definitely not American. And his explanations to the sports that seem so far into us. So you sat there, you listened, you paid attention. And I was wondering the other day, I'm like, I wonder if they have the same uh, explanations for uh, <laughs> for the American sports, you know. And it sounds it's, it sounds very elementary, but that that's that's basically the point. It, it was, do they have explanation for the American sports? <laughs> so I tried, I searched, and I found some. And to me, it it, it was. Funny and interesting listening to uh, the foreigner explain, but it was uh, <laughs> it, it I, I I found it interesting that that to have that perspective of um, someone else who is uh, trying to explain our sports. Now, the interesting thing is, I did the three major U.S. sports. Baseball, basketball, and football. Around the globe, you, you Google football, it takes you to soccer. But here, for us in America, it takes you to American football. And the American football perspective, you, you notice it's never been on the Olympics because it's such an American sport, such a Western sport, that you, pre you pretty much have just America you find NFL. You do have uh, the CFL in Canada and in Europe. They are venturing into small leagues here and there, but it's not a national event like uh, football is with, you know, Super Bowl. It's such a big deal. But um, it's, uh, <laughs> it was interesting to hear the explanations. Now, not to confuse you all, because this is VIOC in action, and it's all about the Olympic sports, but the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee under the leadership of President Angel Chico Morales He's into, hey, sports for all. If any sport gets you out there, gets you active, keeps you healthy, you know, stay involved. You know, help out if, you, if it's in your children's school, if it's uh, something that you want to just, you're a big fan of it, get involved. So I ventured a little bit outside the lines, outside the boundaries to find out about uh, how, 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 what the international perspective on the sport is and especially a sport that you are so familiar with it's ingrained in your dna and then you hear someone else try and explain it. it was it was very interesting for me so let's do this since it's vioc in action we'll give you our um beginner's guide to the olympics right so you'll get the the, the whole point of the olympic movement and stuff and then we'll bring in so uh we'll start with since we're in the middle of um march madness right now we'll start with basketball since that that vibe is there so we do the beginner's guide and then we'll bring you back and listen to someone explain basketball so it's gonna be interesting maybe it's usain bolt michael phelps or lindsey vaughn or maybe it's kathy freeman seb co or nadia kamenechi we all know the olympic games right Every four years, the world comes together, more than 200 countries, and the best athletes compete for a medal, and we're all watching. But have you ever wondered what's behind the games? How is it all organized? Who puts it all together? And yes, who pays for it? Well, most of us know it all began a long time ago, 3,000 years ago to be precise, in ancient Greece. But someone, Pierre de Coubertin, had the bright idea to bring it all back. And to do that, he set up the International Olympic Committee a little over 100 years ago. But the IOC couldn't do it all alone, and still can't. They need a little help from their friends. So, who does what? Each of the sports that takes part in the Olympic Games has an international federation that runs the sport all year round. From rules to referees to records, that's their job. And then there are the more than 200 national Olympic committees around the world. Their job 
is to select the best athletes and get them ready for the games. So, we've got the sports and we've got the athletes, and we can get them to the games. But then there's the host city, which brings the whole thing to life. And that's a big job, and that's a long job. Seven years from the moment the IOC chooses the host city until the moment the cauldron is lit and the games begin. Think about all the things that need to be done to make the games happen. Not just the stadiums, the pools, the ski slopes, but where are the athletes going to stay? What are they going to eat? And how are they going to get to their events? That's what the organizing committee does. It's a very big job, and it takes all those seven years working with the IOC to get it done. And sometimes it can be a bumpy journey, in the summer, there are 10,500 athletes competing in 28 sports, and they have coaches, doctors, trainers, friends, and family. In the winter, it's about 2,500 athletes in seven sports, and they need a lot of people too. And think about the equipment. Several hundred pairs of skis in the winter. In the summer, the equestrian athletes need their horses, and the rowers need their boats. They've all got to be delivered to the right place at the right time in good condition, especially the horses. Okay, so it's a big task, that's for sure. And someone has to pay for it. So, where does the money come from? A large part comes from broadcast rights. Broadcasters pay to air the games in their country. More than half the world's population watched at least some of London 2012. And we also partner with some of the world's leading companies who provide funding for the games and the more than 200 Olympic teams and their athletes. They also supply products and expertise that help the games run smoothly. So, the games are paid for mainly by the IOC and the organizing committee. But governments sometimes take the opportunity of the games to build or improve roads or airports or housing. That can also leave a lasting benefit for the city. But you're probably wondering what happens to the money that's left over and what goes on between the games. The good news is that the money that's left goes back into sport. More than 90% is redistributed to sport around the world not just to help the Olympic Games, but to develop sport. After all, the Olympics is about using sport to make the world a better place. Some of the money goes in scholarships to help fund athletes in their training. It might help pay for a coach for a promising sprinter or provide transportation for a skater to get to the games. And we fund sport where you play too. We support your national Olympic committee and local sports groups. And we work with other groups like the United Nations to bring sport, equipment, and kit to schools and local clubs. We spend a lot of time contributing to building a better world through sport. For example, there's the Youth Olympic Games, helping young athletes to live the Olympic dream and its values. And we use events like Olympic Day, June 23rd, to try to get you to do sport. We want the world to get active and live a healthy lifestyle. And we want to ensure women get the same access to sport as men. At the Olympics, all sports are now open to women, and every single nation has now sent women to the games. We also want to make sure the competition is fair, so we support the athletes and the fight against doping. And then finally, when it's all over and an athlete has run his last race or swam her last length, the IOC also works to try to help them get jobs. When you've spent your whole young life committed to excellence in sport, sometimes you forget about your future, and that's where we lend a helping hand. So, we all love the Olympic Games. But the Olympics is about more than just two weeks every four years. We work all year round, using sport to make the world a better place. To find out more, have a look at our website, olympic.org. Olympic.org gets you that information, and it's, uh, that's it. Straightforward tells you about uh, the Olympics and how, how the machine of the Olympics operate. So now... <laughs> this is for me this is just it was it was a kind of a pleasure listening to someone explain um their perspective on the rules of basketball now this is part where we break it down to the basics pretty much we get it next to nothing as far as uh, uh you've never played the sport before you may have glanced at it so this is the uh, it's an explanation on the rules of basketball again not from an american so it's it might sound weird for have a foreigner explaining basketball like that's that's like the point if you ask me so uh the rules of basketball explained we 
We're going to work that out in a few seconds as we... set that up so we'll do the rules of basketball explained nin explains the rules of basketball the object of the game is for your team to score more points than the opposing team teams are made up of 15 players with five players on the basketball court at any one time they consist of two forwards two guards and a center the game starts with a tip-off once someone has won possession of the ball, they have up to 24 seconds to shoot the ball towards the opponent's basket. These baskets are 10 feet above the ground, on a court that's generally about 94 feet long by 50 feet wide, and varies depending on where you play. To move the ball up the court, you can either pass the ball to a teammate, or dribble the ball where you bounce the ball up and down repeatedly whilst in motion. To score points, a player must shoot the ball into the opponent's basket. You get two points for any shot scored within this arc, if a player scores from a shot outside this arc, this scores three points. Any free throws that are awarded to your team scores one point. Failure to shoot the ball within 24 seconds results in a shot clock violation and the other team is awarded possession of the ball. The opposing team will try and take the ball off you by either blocking shots, rebounding missed shots, or by stealing the ball away from an opposing player so that they can score themselves. The game is played in four 12-minute quarters in the NBA, four 10-minute quarters internationally, or two 20-minute halves in the NCAA, and the highest score at the end of time wins. There are no ties in basketball, so if the scores are tied at the end of regulation, overtime periods will be played to determine the winner. Wow, that was the shortest video ever! Unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. Whilst basketball is an easy game to understand, I've just explained the basic concept of the game. There are a lot of things in basketball that you're not allowed to do. So to make it easy for you to understand, there are generally two types of things you can't do. Violations and fouls. Violations are generally called when you break one of the rules. The main violations include Shot clock violation. As earlier stated, your team has 24 seconds in which to shoot the ball. If you've not shot the ball within this time, a shot clock violation is called and the ball is awarded to the other team. Double dribble. In basketball, you're only allowed to dribble the ball and stop once. If a player then begins to dribble again, this is known as double dribble and the ball is awarded to the other team. Travelling. If a player takes too many steps without dribbling the ball, this is travelling. And surprise surprise, the ball is awarded to the other team. Three in the key. A player cannot stay in the key, which is this section of the court, for more than three seconds. Charging. A violation in which the attacking player runs into a stationary defender. Possession of the ball is awarded to the defending team. There are other violations that I've included a brief description of here, but the ones I previously mentioned are the ones you're most likely to encounter in a game. Fouls. Fouls are the most complicated thing to understand in basketball, but I'll try to explain this in the easiest way I know how. There are three types of fouls. Personal fouls, flagrant fouls, and technical fouls. Personal fouls occur when a player commits illegal contact against another player. Imagine two players, an attacking player with a ball, and a defending player without the ball. Now imagine two giant cylinders that surround them that extend from the floor to the ceiling. Neither of these two players is allowed to encroach in each other's cylindrical space. If an attacking player makes contact with a defender in his space, then it's called an offensive foul against the attacker. If a defender makes contact with an attacker in his space, then it's called a defensive foul against the defender. Any foul in the act of shooting results in free throws being awarded to the attacking team. Two shots for fouls inside the arc, and three shots for fouls outside the arc. If the shot went in and the shooter was fouled, the points they scored count, and they are awarded one extra shot. Flagrant fouls. Flagrant fouls are severe fouls that occur when a player has made violent contact against another player. This always results in the other team being awarded two free throws. Technical foul. Technical fouls are fouls that don't fit the description of either a personal or flagrant foul. Technical fouls can be awarded for fighting, unsportsmanlike conduct, or abuse from players and coaches against referees. Two technical fouls equals an automatic ejection from the game. Any team that commits five or more fouls in any quarter will have three throws awarded against them per subsequent foul. And any one player who has racked up five fouls internationally, or six fouls in the NBA, is fouled out, and can no longer participate in the rest of the game. 
This is a lot to take in, especially understanding how the fouls work. But as you watch or play basketball, the rules will become clear. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it was interesting. Very interesting listening to the perspective of an international. And, and I said English before, but it's not a little Scottish, if you ask me. But nonetheless, um, yeah, the explanation is, is it is so different. It's how many of us who are so familiar with something listen to how someone else explains it. So that's, I guess that's the the angle i am taking on that one but it is now time for our first break here on vioc in action let's do that and we'll be right back Skeleton Racer for Team ISV, and you are listening to VIOC in action. Hi, this is Tim Pitts, 2004 Olympic sailor for the Virgin Islands, sailing the laser class on VIOC in action. This is Mr. One Time for the One Time, Leon Hunt, long jump record holder for Team VI. Thank you for logging on to VIOC in action. All right, and welcome back to the show. And we just had, uh, <laughs> before the break, we had that uh, interesting take on the American uh, sport of uh, the American sport of basketball, explained by someone not from America. And that was my perspective. And I know a lot of people are gonna say, "Oh, it's not an American sport anymore. It's very international." Absolutely, and 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 we we are so grateful that the entire world is getting involved in all sports and i'm covering the three major sports in the u.s which are baseball basketball football so we already heard the rules as explained by someone concerning uh basketball so i was thinking yeah it's it's pretty international they they do play basketball in, in in developing countries for sure so industrialized countries not not so much developing but uh they, they, it's it's spreading um so you heard that explanation now now the one that uh says second nature to me is baseball and i was like would they really have one i was even surprised that they have one but you got to put yourself in another man's position because me listening to winter sports or seeing winter sports i i needed a a quick explanation and it was there for me so i guess they did the same thing someone who is not familiar with my sport baseball basketball football they would need an explanation as well so i searched for it and sure enough there was one right there which gives an explanation <laughs> the rules of uh baseball so I found it interesting. I say, let's check it out. So, uh, here it is, the rules of baseball. Because baseball, for me, talk about um, second nature. That's, that's, that's in my blood. I, <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. But uh, let's see if someone else can explain it. The rules of baseball. Then explains the rules of baseball. Baseball is an American sport and is played with two teams of 40 players in Major League Baseball, with nine players taken to the field at any one time. The object of the game is for your team to score more runs than the opposing team. To score a run, a player must hit the ball between the foul lines and run across the three bases and back to home. A hit outside these lines is classed as a foul ball and the batter is not allowed to run. The essence of the game is between the pitcher of one team against the batter of the other team. As mentioned before, the batter's job is to hit the ball between the foul lines, but the pitcher's job is to get the batter out by throwing into the strike zone. This is an imaginary box that's the width of home plate and roughly between the batter's armpits and knees. If the pitcher throws the ball through this area, it's a strike. If the batter swings and misses any ball, it's also a strike. If the batter hits the ball outside the foul lines, 
this can be a first or second strike only. And obviously three strikes means you're out. A pitch outside this area is called a ball. Four balls against the batter and he gets to walk to first base. That sounds simple enough but there are three other ways for a team to get you out. Firstly, if the batter hits the ball along the ground, the opposing team can throw the ball to the base he's running to. If the ball beats the batter to the base, he's out. A batter can be tagged out whilst running between the bases. If he hits the ball and the ball is caught in the air by the opposing team, he's also out. Once three outs have been made, their half of the inning is over and the other team gets to bat. Once both teams have batted, this is known as an inning. The game is played over nine innings. There are no ties in baseball, so if the score is tied after nine innings, extra innings will be played to determine the winner. Now that's basically it, but there's a few other rules you'll need to understand before playing or going to a game. For example, home run. If a batter hits the ball out of the park between the foul lines, the batter, and anyone else standing on the bases, gets to walk freely around the bases and back to home. All runs score. Stealing bases. To help batters move along the bases, some players will try and make a run for the next base. This is a risky gamble as the opposing team will be prepared for this and will try and get you out. If the batter is caught out, he is caught stealing. If a catcher misses or drops the ball, the batter is allowed to try and steal first base. Tagging up. If the ball is caught in the air, any player standing on the bases must start from that base before running to the next one. Ground rule double. If in the rare instance a ball is hit onto the ground between the foul lines and leaves the ballpark, the batter automatically walks to second base. Double play. This is where a ball is hit into play and the defending team gets two outs, usually by way of throwing to one base and then another. Designated hitter. In Major League Baseball, American League teams can opt to have someone bat in place of the pitcher. This player is known as the designated hitter and he usually specializes in hitting the ball and scoring runs. In the National League and everywhere else, the pitchers must bat for themselves. There are many other rules not discussed here, but as you watch or play baseball, the rules will become clear. And that is rules of baseball explained. Again, it was interesting to me. And uh, terms that I would never use, he, you, you heard him there say that uh, if the batter misses on the third strike and the catcher also drops it or misses it, the batter is allowed to steal first base. I would never say steal first base. So although the batter is allowed to try to get to first base on the pass ball third strike so it was it was it was different for me listening you know it was like yeah these they have a totally uh different perspective on on the way someone who is already familiar with it would would take it into consideration now baseball is one of those sports that have uh early on started exploring for international players so uh, you've had a uh, latin ball players forever involved in baseball so whether uh, after integration or what but we've always had uh, international players nowadays you have players from i mean the east japan and, and korea getting involved you have uh, one or two from uh, Europe. You might have an Italian ball player. I think there's like one guy from Australia now, you know. But Latin America, North America, you have tons of ball players. Even some from South America, from uh, Venezuela and stuff. So, you know, that, that's the international aspect. And I guess in those countries where it's not the number one sport, these type of explanations help. So that's that's always good. So now, here's the biggie. <laughs> this is the big deal here. This one now, uh, American football. So, you know, it's. <laughs> I think this one is going to be more interesting than, than any of the others, actually. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's try this one. Let's do the rules. Of American football and again this is from the international perspective so kind of something you've known all your life hearing someone else try to make sense of it they're pretty close for the most part they're, they're, they're on the money the explanations are on the money for the most part just a terminology of or two could be tweaked and some of the explanations could be 
uh, explain in, in greater depth. But I guess that will come with, with the playing of the game. So let's try this one. The rules of American football. And see uh, how, how that will be uh, explained because it, it will be a little different. Nin explains the rules of American football. The object of the game is for your team to score more points than the opposing team. Teams are made up of 46 players in the NFL, with 11 players taken to the field at any one time. The field is 100 yards long by 53 yards wide, with two 10-yard end zones at each end. White markings on the field help players, referees and spectators keep a track of what's going on. The game starts with a kickoff. The team with possession of the ball is known as the offense, and the team without the ball is the defense. The job of the offense is to move the ball up the field and try and score points. This can be done by either running forwards with the ball, or by throwing it up the field for a teammate to catch. The offense is given four chances, or four downs, to make at least 10 yards. If the offense manages to move the ball 10 yards or more, they will retain possession of the ball, whilst given another four downs to make another 10 yards. On your TV screen you will see this graphic. This tells you what down the team is on, and this tells you how many yards they need to make. If you're also watching this on TV, they will also show you the lines they need to cross in order to make their downs. The defense's job is to stop the offense moving the ball forwards by tackling. This includes pulling them to the ground, stopping them from moving forward, or forcing them off the field. If the offense fails to move the ball 10 yards within 4 downs, the ball is given to the defending team at that point. The defending team will then bring on their offensive players and try and move the ball in the opposite direction so that they can score. You will most likely see the offense kick the ball away on fourth down to make it more difficult for the other team to score. Teams will usually have three different units of 11 players that come on the field at different times. They include the offense. These players will usually come on the field when they have possession of the ball. The offensive unit consists of these positions. The quarterback is the most important player on the field, as he's the one who decides to pass the ball up the field, hand it off to a teammate so that they can run with it, or decide to run with it himself. These offensive line positions are usually responsible for protecting the quarterback. The wide receivers are responsible for running down the field to catch the ball thrown by the quarterback. The tight end is responsible for blocking and also catching the ball in the middle of the field. And the running back and fullback is responsible for running with the ball up the field. The defense. These players will usually come on the field when the other team has the ball. The defensive unit consists of these positions. The defensive line is responsible for moving past the offensive line. The linebackers stop running backs coming through the defensive line, and they're also responsible for attacking the quarterback. The cornerbacks try and stop the wide receivers, and the safeties try and stop the pass up the middle of the field. Special teams. Special teams are specialist players that come on the field when there's a kick involved. Within the special teams is a mixture of offensive and defensive players mixed with either a punter or kicker for offense, or a punt returner for defense. Now you know what all the players do and how the game is played. But how do you score? In American football, there's four different ways of scoring. Number one, a touchdown. The main way of scoring is via a touchdown. If the ball is carried into the end zone area, or thrown and caught in the end zone, this is a touchdown and is worth six points. Unlike in rugby, you don't need to touch the ball down onto the ground. All you have to do is cross the line with the nose of the ball to score. Number two, extra points. Once a touchdown has been scored, you have the option of kicking it through the uprights for an extra point, or try and pass or run the ball into the end zone for an extra two points. Most teams play it safe and go with the one point. Number three, field goal. At any time, the team with the ball can kick the ball between the posts and over the crossbar. To do this, they must hand it to a teammate who will hold it down to the ground, ready for the kicker to make a kick. A successful kick scores three points. Number four, a safety. If the defense tackles an offensive player behind his own goal line, the defending team scores two points. The game is played in four 15-minute quarters for a combined playing time of 60 minutes. High score at the end of 60 minutes wins. Ties are rare in American football, and overtime periods are played if necessary to determine the winner. Different leagues have different rules about tie games. Is that it? Is that all I need to know? Well, you're almost there, but American football is filled with lots of rules, and you'll need to understand a few more of them before playing or watching a game. For example, fumble. If a ball carrier drops the ball, that's a fumble. Any player on the field can recover the ball by diving onto it. The team that recovers a fumble gets possession of the ball. 
interception. An aggressive defense can regain possession of the ball by catching or intercepting passes that are meant for players on the other team. Both fumble recoveries and interceptions can be run back into the end zone for touchdowns. Sack. If the defense tackles a quarterback whilst he has possession of the ball, this is known as a sack. This is detrimental to the offense as a down is wasted and this usually results in a loss of yards. Incomplete pass. If a pass intended to a receiver hits the ground first or is thrown out of bounds, this is ruled an incomplete pass. A down is wasted and play restarts from the spot of the last down. Penalty. If a player breaks one of the rules, referees will throw flags onto the field. They will determine who made the foul and how many yards his team should be penalized. Challenge. If a coach disagrees with the decision on the field, they can throw red flags onto the field. The previous play will then be reviewed and if the challenge is successful, the ruling on the field is reversed. If the challenge is unsuccessful and the ruling on the field stands, they forfeit one timeout. Timeout. If a team wants to stop the clock to regroup, take a break or discuss strategy, they are allowed three timeouts per half, each timeout lasts 60 seconds and players get a break of 12 minutes at half time. Now this is a lot to take in, but once you start playing or watching American football, the rules will become clear. If you found this video at all helpful, please like, share with your friends, rate, comment and subscribe. It takes me ages to make one of these things, and good karma is very much appreciated. Be sure to follow me on Twitter also, but in the meantime, enjoy American football. It's true, you have to... Invest a lot of time into watching American football for the rules to become clear. But you heard some of the, you know, the quirky explanations to some of the things. And one of the rules that he actually explained that almost caught me by surprise because it's fairly new, but it is now part of the game, is the challenge. Uh, with the challenge in the rules and the replay and all. That's, it's kind of weird. So, uh, it, you know, it's, most games are leaning in that direction now because of the the convenience of having every single aspect of the game uh, videotaped or recorded in some way. So that's the, the rules of, bas of uh, baseball and American football from the perspective of a non-American. I just thought it was interesting. I hope you did too. But it is that time for a final break for VIOC in action. We'll take that break and we'll come back for the last segment of the show. Hey, this is Sydney Paul, member of the Virgin Islands National Bowling Team, and you're listening to VIOC in action. Hi, this is Adrian Durant, coach for the VI National Track and Field Team. Set your goals and work hard to achieve them. Believe in yourself, and anything is possible. Tune into VIOC in action to learn how you can take your game to the next level. And remember, if it's to be, it's up to me. This is Dr. Jerry Smith, physical therapist with the VA Olympic Committee. To unleash the elite athlete in you, the key ingredients are good nutrition, hard work, and dedication. Give yourself what you need to get in and stay in the game. Tune into VIOC in action for tips and fun activities to unleash the elite athlete in you. All right, welcome to the final segment here of the show. And of course, this is VIOC in action, and it's all about encouraging the entire Virgin Islands community to get involved in sports, support the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee, and support all of its fantastic member federations that are involved in sport and allowing Virgin Islanders to have that international global recognition they deserve as super athletes so 
you know, if you know someone who is involved in uh, in your sport, federation president, and you want them to make an appearance on the show, man, just tell them about it. Tell them get it going because the VIOC has active VI sports in archery, athletics, which is track and field. Basketball, boxing, cycling, equestrian, fencing, golf, judo, wrestling, volleyball, triathlon, tennis, taekwondo, swimming, soccer, and shooting. One of our most prominent sports that we thriving is sailing. So, so much so that we have one Olympic medal for the Virgin Islands. And that was indeed won by a sailor. Let's hear about this sailor and his awesome history. Hi, this is uh, Peter Holmberg, silver medalist for the Virgin Islands in 1988, and you're listening to VIOC in action. Peter William Holmberg was born on October 4th, 1960 on St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He and older brother John were introduced to the sport of sailing at ages four and six respectively by their parents, Richard and Louise Holmberg. Richard was based on St. Thomas while serving on the submarines in the Navy and returned on his honeymoon never to leave. Both Richard and Louise went on to become great sailors, Richard competing in the 1972 Olympics and Louise winning the Sunfish Worlds. The waters of the Virgin Islands became Peter's playground and he was soon competing in local races at the newly formed St. Thomas Yacht Club. By the age of nine, he was competing in national events, capped by a third place finish in the Sunfish World Championship at the age of 16. He attended St. Peter and Paul Catholic School, then pursued a non-traditional path toward his Charlotte Amalie High School diploma via high school classes, night courses, College of the Virgin Islands, and GED studies. Holmberg then transferred to California's Santa Rosa Junior College, continued on to Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz, and finally Sonoma State University where he competed on the university sailing team and graduated with a BA degree in management. Returning to St. Thomas, Holmberg set his sights on the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, California. While working as a sailmaker to make end meets, he chose a single-handed fin class and trained locally for a year before raising enough cash to try and buy a fin and head to the States for the final year of training. He represented the Virgin Islands well, placing 11th among the 36 both fields. Encouraged by his initial success, Peter hatched a plan to campaign for the 1988 Olympics game in Busan, South Korea. His campaign, however, would benefit from better strategic planning, a longer fundraising period, and a two-year training regimen. Peter traveled to South Korea a year prior to the Games to compete in the pre-Olympics regatta. He finished eighth and acquired a wealth of knowledge about the event, supplied boats, and challenging conditions of Busan. Peter's reconnaissance mission spurred two key decisions, to purchase a Korean-made Hyundai fin and to train in the waters of the Virgin Islands, which best replicated the rough sailing conditions of South Korea. Holmberg's strategy worked. At age 27, Peter won silver medal at the 24th Olympic Games, the first Olympic medal ever won by the U.S. Virgin Islands. Following this Olympic success, Peter became the team Hensman and helped Matador II win the 1990 Maxi World Championship. In 1992, Peter ventured into match racing and built a team of Virgin Islanders to compete in the international circuit. He began as an unranked skipper competing with the wild card slots, but moved up quickly in the world and by 1999 he was ranked number three in the world. Peter reached pinnacle of match racing in number one world ranking when he won the 2001-2002 Swedish Match Tour Championship with an impressive run that included victories in the Bermuda Gold Cup, Steinlager's Line 7 Cup and Congressional Cup. In 1996, Peter formed the Virgin Islands America's Cup Challenge, a syndicate later calling itself Team Caribbean that would quest for the 2000 America's Cup in Auckland, New Zealand. The syndicate united the people of the Virgin Islands and raised an astounding $5 million towards the budget. But unable to secure the necessary amount of deadline to start boat construction, the team opted to merge with Team Dennis Connor in January 1999. Peter transitioned to the afterguard of Stars and Stripes competing in the 2000 America's Cup Challenge Selection Series, where Team Dennis Connor ultimately finished third. Peter then joined Oracle BMW team as helmsman for the 2003 America's Cup. After three years of boat development and training, Oracle finished a close second in the Louis Vuitton Challenger Series. 
Late in 2003, Peter accepted an offer from the 2003 America's Cup winner, Ling Hee, of Switzerland to join the defender as a helmsman. Then followed three years of intensive training and boat development in Europe, where in a contest that followed, Ling Hee defeated Emirates Team New Zealand 5-2 in the final and successfully defended the 2007 America's Cup in Valencia, Spain. Following that remarkable victory, Peter returned home to the Virgin Islands, a master helmsman now capable of achieving perfect balance on any boat. Peter sought the same sense of equilibrium in his personal life and he found it perched on the deck of his tropical home in the same island where his journey to the pinnacle of sailing had begun decades before. Peter now bases himself on St. Thomas and offers professional sailing, consulting and speaking services to clients worldwide. VIOC Moment in History, Peter Holmberg. VIOC Moment in History there with Peter Holmberg. And, you know, we are moving towards creating more great history through our awesome athletes, our Virgin Islanders, who are competing across the globe to make their mark internationally and let the world know about VIOC or Team ISV. Talking about Team ISV, if you want to show your support for the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee, you can go to www.virginislandsolympic.org and get yourself one of the Team Virgin Islands license plates. It shows a fabulous example of our logo, and you can get it customized, or you can just get one of our numbers in the series to help us out. It's 100 bucks for the plates, but we truly appreciate any assistance you can give us. Also, you can get your team uh, Virgin Islands hat. It's only 15 bucks. Buy a couple of them, give them out as gifts, and let people know that uh, you support the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee. And if you have more information that you want to share with us here at VIOC in Action or the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee, and give us a call, 340-719-8462. That, of course, is during business hours. You can also visit our website, www.virginislandsolympics.org. Or you can send us an email to noc at virginislandsolympics.org. For those of you who uh, go to Facebook, yes, that's right, check us out on www.facebook.com slash Virgin Islands Olympics. And you can stay up to date with what we got going on there on the Facebook. Because Facebook, I think it's Facebook is probably a little more up to date than the website because... You can uh, you can tag your information on there and just keep us up to date with all the federations that have great stuff going on. So it's uh, Facebook is a good way to get your information out. You can tag us there as well and we'll know what's going on. Even if you're not directly associated but you want your event to be exposed to those who follow the Vernon Hills Olympic Committee, you can do that. And... Uh, uh, next show, I'm going to give you some information that, uh, you know, uh, last year the VIOC celebrated 50 years and they were recently honored at the legislature of the Virgin Islands. So we will definitely check that out in an upcoming show. But this has been at Neil Bobby Thomas for VIOC in Action. I hope you enjoy the show, and we'll see you next week. But before we go, a few folks that want to drop a good word as well. Hey, this is Lynn Reed, Secretary General of the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee. Wanted to thank you for listening to VIOC in Action. This is Angel Chico Morales, President of the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee, thanking you for joining us on VIOC in Action.